Hi everyone, welcome back to Information Economics. Um, today we want to introduce you the topic about channel coordination with returns or return contracts. So uh, this will be a lecture that we start to introduce the issue of incentives. We have spent uh, three weeks to talk about um, basic optimization theory and game theory. Okay, that will be our tools for studying the incentive issues. So in this in this video, I will talk about the introduction or the basic idea or the basic trade-offs, basic important things about the incentives. And then I will talk about one specific paper in the next three videos. It will be something about return contracts, about the model and analysis and the findings. So <coughs> We know that there are decentralized systems, and centralization may be very good if we want to get efficiency. Okay, in some sense, we know if there is a system that is decentralized, then the best thing we may do is to do complete centralization or complete integration. That's going to make the system as efficient as possible. But we will say that it may be impossible because each person has his or her own self-interest, okay? Or there are some rules that prevent people to integrate, something like antitrust laws, okay? So if complete integration is possible, it's good. But facing a decentralized system, we will not assume it can be centralized or it can be integrated. Okay? We will try to study those decentralized systems that cannot be integrated. Part of the reason is that if a system can be integrated, can be fully integrated, then there is no problem at all. That is optimal. So we will only study or we are only interested about those situations that fully in, full integration is impossible. We will assume that people are all selfish and they do not act to maximize other people's utility or to maximize system efficiency. Okay? And then under these assumptions, we will try to design mechanisms to improve the efficiency. Starting from this lecture, we will talk about possible mechanisms in different situations for improving efficiency. Some issues under decentralization are the following. So, first is the incentive issues. In a decentralized system, people have different objectives, and sometimes the system has no and uh, the system does not give enough incentives for players to act toward efficiency. For example, um, in a system, workers need incentives to work hard. Okay, as a company, we prefer workers to work hard, but workers need incentives for them to work hard. Similarly, students need incentives to keep their labs clean. Okay, from the system's perspective or from the society's perspective, we prefer clean labs. But for those students that are really using labs, they need incentives to make it clean. Manufacturers need incentives to improve product quality, like do not use fake oils as the materials. Consumers need incentives to pay for a product. If there's no incentive, then consumers will simply go away. So that's going to tell us in a decentralized system, typically incentive is the issue. As a mechanism designer or a rule designer, your goal is to provide incentives to players. Okay? And through your mechanism. We're going to see concrete examples. Another aspect is the information part. Efforts of workers and students, uh, I mean the efforts of students, they are something we call it hidden. 
Okay, their efforts or their actions cannot be observed or cannot be verified. So that's some hidden information to the mechanism designer or to the society. At the same time, product quality and the willingness to pay or willingness to use are also hidden. Okay, so what does that mean? Suppose I care about clean labs, then that means I prefer students to 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 exert efforts to make the lab clean. Okay, that's something I want. The key here is that I cannot. Um, reward my students for paying efforts, like I cannot monitor their actions or their behaviors in the lab, and say if you spend one hour to clean the lab, I pay you five dollars. If you do it for two hours, I pay you ten dollars. Okay, that's not possible because I cannot stay in the lab for twenty four hours. So I probably can only look at the outcome. And that may not be useful because there may be multiple students in the lab. As long as one puts the effort to clean the lab, all others can be free riders. If I only judge according to outcome, so actually the first part is just the moral hazard problem introduced in the case, and the second part is just the. Hidden information or the adverse selection problem in the case you just read. Okay, so in general, information issues amplify or even create incentive issues. Okay, the key is incentive issue, and when we have private information in the system, we will have stronger incentive issues. We'll see that in the future. Today we will only focus on info incentive issues, and starting from next week we will also talk about information issues. So, if multiple players in the system have different interests or different objective functions, we typically say there is incentive misalignment, and our goal is to align players' incentives. If we can adjust, we can somehow adjust their objective functions, so that make all of them have the same goal or the same objective. We say we align their incentives, and the system efficiency can typically be improved. So, as an example, an employer or or the 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 boss typically wants the workers to work as hard as possible. But a worker always prefer to take vacations instead of hard working. Okay, so there is a very obvious incentive misalignment between the employer and the employee. The employer prefers the employee to work hard, but the employee does not. So to better align their incentives, the employer must put something that can induce. The employee to work hard into the employee's utility function. Basically, you in employee only care about the payment, right? So as long as you pay the employee, the employee cares nothing about his effort as part of the employer's profit. If the employee works hard, the company can earn a lot of money. But if those money are all taken by the employer, then the employee has no incentive to work hard. So that's why we see some sales bonus or commissions at employer at employees payment. Okay, many workers are paid partly or fully, or mostly. Um, uh, many workers are paid with some bonus or commissions. According to uh, the amount of sales they generate, or the whether they meet some、um, criteria set by the employers, okay. So this is to induce the employees to work hard toward some objective that is shared with the employer, okay. That is going to make employees care about the. Performance of the company, okay. 
that's incentive mis uh, uh, incentive alignment. So <clears throat> when there is no incentive alignment, we may see something called double marginalization. You actually have seen it in the past. So this typically happens in a supply chain or distribution channel, like this. Suppose we reconsider the pricing problem in a supply chain. The unit cost is C, and then the manufacturer definitely charges a W star, which is a wholesale price that is greater than C. Okay? And then the retailer will add something to the wholesale price to make the retail price. So we have one layer of marginalization and another layer of marginalization. We have two layers of marginalization. That's double marginalization. And let's make the retail price too high. Oh, here, too high simply means it's inefficient. Ideally, it should be at some level. But with two layers, the, the, the retail price is higher than that efficient level. And both firms are hurt due to this double marginalization. And then we say this system is inefficient because the equilibrium decisions, in particular retail price, is too high. Okay, This double marginalization has been observed by you. There is another example that we want to address here. It's called the in, um, indirect news vendor problem. So let's see this. Uh, in another situation, there is a manufacturer and a retailer and the retailer is making an inventory decision for perishable products instead of the pricing decision. So in many distribution channels or supply chains, the, the retail price is fixed due to severe competition or regulations. Okay? You just cannot modify the price. And all you can do is to find to accurately set your inventory levels so that as a news vendor, you can earn as much money as possible. So, you, you know, uh, the system works like this. First, the manufacturer chooses the wholesale price W, okay? And then, the retailer, based on the wholesale price and the downstream demand, the retailer must decide the order quantity. So, this retailer is just a news vendor. And then each of them will try to maximize their expected profit. For the retailer, the expected profit is this one, the retail price, which is the constant, times the expected sales, and then minus the wholesale price times the order quantity. And then the manufacturer's problem is simple. It's just the sales margin times the order quantity or the sales quantity from the manufacturer to the retailer. So, in this particular model, the downstream retailer is just a news vendor, and the manufacturer would like to sell as much as possible, okay, if the, 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 the wholesale price is fixed. Okay, so this is the retailer's and the manufacturer's problem. Uh, if you need some review about news vendor, go back to see the videos in the previous week. Let's see whether this decentralized system creates some inefficiency. So suppose the two firms integrate. Okay, we already know if they integrate, then the system is efficient. Then in this case, they don't really have a wholesale price, and what they need to do is to choose a Q, a order quantity or the production quantity to maximize this particular function. This is the channel's objective function. And the cost here is CQ. Okay? This is just a very classic news vendor problem. And then we know the first best quantity is something satisfying this equation. Capital F is the uh, demand CDF or the demand distribution function. The optimum quantity should satisfy this equation and determined by C and P.
and the demand distribution. Okay, this is the standard result of the news vendor problem, and then this is something we called critical ratio. Okay. Now suppose we only we suppose we focus on the distributed or the decentralized channel, then the retailer is solving his problem to find the retailer optimal inventory level. In this case, the retailer's problem is almost the same as the channel's problem. The only difference is that the unit cost becomes W rather than C. And then immediately we can see the retailer optimal quantity basically will be less than the first best quantity. The proof is there, you may go over it, but the intuition is very simple. It's simply because the wholesale price in equilibrium will be greater than the cost, right? The, re the manufacturer wants to earn some money, so the manufacturer definitely will choose a W, a wholesale price, which is greater than C. And if that happens, the retailer is going to face a larger cost, and then the retailer will lower or the retailer will reduce the order quantity. So, from the system's perspective, from the channel's perspective, the ordering quantity is lower than the efficient level. Fewer consumers in expectation can get the product, and the fewer money is earned by the channel in equilibrium or in, in expectation. Okay, so decentralization creates a reduction on the order quantity and then introduces inefficiency. This is just another example of double marginalization. So, how may we reduce inefficiency? This, of course, is case by case. For different systems, we need different ways or different mechanisms to reduce inefficiency. Today, we will look at the indirect news vendor as an example for analyzing it and an example of designing new mechanisms to reduce inefficiency. We will assume complete integration is impossible. And then our goal is to adjust the mechanism or adjust the game rules to introduce to, to induce different behaviors of the players. Okay? And for a supply chain or the distribution channel. Basically, that's going to adjust the contract format. Previously, it's just a wholesale price contract for one unit, $5, for two units, $10, and so on and so on. But we may adjust the contract format just a little bit, and then we will see things will change uh, significantly. And then the system may become more efficient. Well, we will see this. Um, how to do this. This belongs to the field of supply chain coordination or in general supply chain contracting. It's about how may we design new formats of supply chain contracts so that the supply chain can be more efficient. Okay? There are a lot of papers, a lot of studies in this field. Today we talk about what. Okay, thank you. Okay, so let's study return contracts. So, as we mentioned, we have that indirect news vendor problem. Okay, because there is a retail, um, a, a whole, um, because there is a manufacturer sets wholesale prices, so the retailer is facing a higher cost, and then the production quantity, or the inventory level is too low. Okay. We know, uh, optimally, the inventory level should be higher, but there is no reason for the retailer to order that much. Why? Why the retailer just order that few amount of inventory? Basically, that's because the demand is uncertain. If I order a lot, I am having the risk for not selling all of them, right? I don't know how much will be the demand. 
So I am afraid that if I order too much, then some leftover cannot be sold, and I am wasting my money. In this original model, the retailer takes all the risks, right? And the manufacturer has no risk at all. The manufacturer only need to look at how much the retailer orders, and then the manufacturer makes the production. The manufacturer has no risk regarding demand uncertainty. Okay, so how may we induce the retailer to order more? Now is clear. We want to lower down, or we want to reduce their risks. So one particular way is for the manufacturer to share the risk with the retailer, and then naturally return or buy back contracts may be useful. That simply means if you have some left over. I am willing to pay you to compensate you a little bit, and that's going to help you reduce the risk or reduce the loss for ordering too much. Okay, that's return contract or buyback contract. So, <clears throat> a return contract, as we say, is a risk sharing mechanism. Okay, when the product are not all sold. The retailer is allowed to return, according to the policy, all or some unsold products to get some return credits. Okay, these are just the payments, the transfer payments from the manufacturer to the retailer, based on the amount of unsold or the amount of returned products. We call it the return credits. The contractual terms will be expanded from just a wholesale price to three numbers. So these are the numbers that they need to decide at the contracting stage. Again, W is the wholesale price, the unit wholesale price, and then small R is the buyback price for each re unsold product. How much I am willing to pay you? That's small R. And then capital R is the percentage of products that can be returned. For example, if I sold you one and one hundred units. Then probably I would say,、uh, at most twenty percent. That means twenty units can be returned. If you have eighty units of unsold product, I only take twenty units. Something like that. Okay. So capital R may be some numbers between zero and one, showing how much of products, how much of the sold quantities can be returned. So. With these numbers, we have several alternatives for the channel. We may have a full return with full credit contract. That means W,、uh, sorry, R is one, and the small R is just W. That means you may return everything at the original price. We may alternatively have a full return with partial credit contract. You may return everything. But I only give you some of the money, not all. Probably you paid ten dollars for wholesale price, but I only give you eight or seven dollars as the return credits. Similarly, we may have partial return. That means you are not allowed to return everything, but for each unit, I pay you the original price, or partial return with partial credits. In general, the Contracting stage becomes more complicated because originally there's only just one variable, but now we have three variables. Okay, so analytically we will show you how、uh, efficient a re return contract is for general demand、uh, functions. But before that, let's get a more concrete idea with some numerical examples. Uh. Let's consider a channel with a manufacturer and a retailer, and the unit production cost is ten, the unit retail price is fifty, and the random demand is just uniformly distributed between zero and one hundred. So it's just a simple news vendor setting. As a benchmark, let's first consider the efficient inventory level. Suppose the two firms integrate with each integrate with each other, then. We may try to solve Q T star as the efficient inventory level. This is just the basic news vendor problem. Okay, so this 
is our um, okay. Let me write it down. F of Q star Q T star should be this ratio, right? Because this is uniform distribution between zero and one, and then we have this critical ratio according to our production cost and the retail price. Immediately we get the optimal, uh, optimal quantity for the systems from the systems perspective, and then we may also derive the expected system profit like this. Okay. This is just the news vendor setting, and because this is uniform distribution, we can complete this integral and simply express the profit function as a polynomial, a second degree polynomial. Okay, so with this in mind, we know AT is going to contribute $1,600 to the channel. As the total system profit, so these are something you already know how to do, as the basic news vendor problem. Now, suppose <coughs> they are using a wholesale price contract, then we want to know what's going to happen. With here, I don't want to solve for the optimal uh, wholesale price. You may do it, and you may verify that the optimal wholesale price is thirty. Okay, this is something you can do, but I will skip the proof here. Instead, I will just assume that we will focus on the case with 30 as the wholesale price. And then, in this case, you can also verify the retailer will order 40 units. You simply need to plug in 30 to the previous page formula. You will see that the quantity will be 40. And then, the retailer's expected profit can again be derived as a second order polynomial. The only thing that is changed is just this number. Previously, previously it's 10, now it's 30. Now, we can show you that the retailer's expected profit with the retailer optimal quantity is 400. The manufacturer gets 800. In total, it's 1200 or $1,200. That's smaller than the maximum or the system efficient total profit. Okay, previously it's sixteen thousand, sixteen hundred. Now it's just twelve hundred. So wholesale contract is inefficient. Okay, wholesale contract is inefficient. How about this? Let's consider the following return contract. I say okay, wholesale price is still there. And then the percentage of allowed return, I set it to be 1. That means for everything that you cannot sell, I'm going to take it back. And then I will pay you $5. So, with that in mind, now we can write down the new objective function of the retailer. For the retailer, the retailer needs to find an order quantity Q that can maximize its expected profit. Now we have, again, the usual part of a news vendor problem. This is the expected sales revenue, okay? And also this is the cost that the retailer must pay to the manufacturer. So the only thing that is new is here. So, what is this? Uh, Again, x is the demand dummy variable. When x is between 0 or q, that means your demand is less than your order quantity. In that case, you are, a, you are allowed to return those unsold product. Unsold quantity is exactly q minus x. For those unsold product, each of them you can earn $5 back. Okay? And... One, uh, 1 over 100 is just the density function. So this particular term is describing the amount of expected return credits that the retailer can earn. If Q is larger, then this term will become larger. Okay? If you order more, then your return credit will be expected to become larger. 
or if q becomes smaller, then this term will become smaller. Anyway, in total we have three terms, the sales revenue, the return credit, and the purchasing cost. After some derivations, we get this as the objective function. So you probably can verify. This 1 over 40 q squared is just what you have for return, uh, return credits. With this objective function, we can show that the optimal order quantity slightly increased from 40 to 44.44. And then the retailer's expected profit can also become larger. This result is not very surprising, right? Previously, the, 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 um, before we are using the return contract, the wholesale contract is just saying that uh, the wholesale price is 30, but you are not allowed to return. Now, some products are allowed to be returned, so the retailer is, of course, uh, getting more money. Okay, So the retailer is better off. But what's interesting is that the manufacturer also earns more money. Okay, The manufacturer also earns more money. Basically, the manufacturer is just being more generous to the retailer, right? Because now the manufacturer is willing to take to buy some unsold products back at this price, $5. So the manufacturer becomes more generous to the retailer. And what's interesting is that the manufacturer can also earn more money when the manufacturer becomes more generous to the retailer. The intuition is just what we mentioned. It's because the re the manufacturer now shares some risk from the retailer. And then that's going to help the retailer to order more. And this more, this larger sales revenue earned by the manufacturer can compensate his loss about buying those products back. So the manufacturer provides a guarantee to the retailer and then everyone is happy. Okay? So naturally, the expected system profit is just uh, greater than the previous amount. Previously, it's just 1,200. Now it's 1,200 and more, but this is still not the efficient level. In fact, that was just one option. And here we have another option. Suppose the return credit is increased from 5 to 10. So the manufacturer is being even more generous to the retailers. In this case, the retailer's expected profit can be modified into this. Okay? This term simply becomes larger. And, oh sorry, this is a typo. Okay, this should be 10. So the return credit, uh, the expected return credit under the same order quantity now is larger. And you may verify that in this case, the order quantity is 50. The optimal order quantity is 50. The retailer again earns more. And the manufacturer in this case also earns more because the manufacturer successfully induces the retailer to order more. So both of them earns more money. And in total, they earn a lot, but still, this is not at the efficient level. So we may combine all these results and prepare a table like this. For the wholesale contract, we can just say that you are allowed to return everything, but I don't pay you anything. Okay, so that's 3001 as the contract parameters. For the two return contracts, we say the small r is just 5 and 10. We can see that when the retailer, uh, when the manufacturer becomes more generous, the quantity, the order quantity becomes larger and larger, which is reasonable because the retailer now do not need to afraid too much about leftovers. And then retailer earns more money. The manufacturer also earns more money. So we say from here to here, this is a win-win situation. Okay, We don't really need to integrate the two firms. The two firms don't need to collaborate with each other. Instead, 
we only need to offer a different contract, and then both of them can be better off. Okay, so this is some findings that you may want to keep in mind, but this is still not at the efficient level. So now we will have several natural questions. First, when R goes up, will Q always goes up? You probably want to think about this, and also. For pi r and pi m, do they always increase when small r increase? You may also want to think about this. Finally, we want to ask whether there will be any small r that can induce the retailer to order the efficient quantity. Okay, and if that r exists, we may expect that the total system profit. Can be at the efficient level. Okay, we want to ask whether this small r exists or not. And also, suppose that small r does not exist, we still have hope, right? Because capital R may also be adjusted, and also the wholesale price may be adjusted. So there are many many different questions that we need to answer, and. This simple numerical study is just not enough. We need a general model to deal with the optimization of all these three parameters, and also for general demand functions. Okay, so we want to ask, when may we achieve what we call channel coordination?、Uh, that's going to induce the retailer to order the system optimal quantity. And make the channel as efficient as the integrated channel. And now we're going to present a general analytical model to really solve this question. Thank you. Okay, so now let's talk about the model and how to solve that model. Again,、uh, mathematics are not the most important thing for us to get、uh, ideas. But they are required because only through mathematical models and the analysis we can understand and we can deliver a useful message from that model. Okay, let's start. So we're going to consider a manufacturer and a retailer in an indirect channel. The product is perishable, and there is just a single period of demand. That demand, of course, is random. Production is under、uh, make to order, and that basically means the manufacturer does not face demand uncertainty. The manufacturer only need to get ordered and then make the production. However, however, the retailer is a news vendor. That means the retailer must prepare the inventory before the selling season starts. We're going to use the following notations in this、uh, video. The notations are a little bit different from the paper, but there is a one-to-one -one mapping, so you should have no difficulty to understand the paper. First is the unit production cost, which you see. Unit wholesale price will be W. Unit return credit and percentage of allowable return are small r and capital R. The retailer is going to choose an order quantity capital Q. And the demand, the random demand, has capital F and small f as the distribution and the density functions. We're going to assume the following basic assumptions: the wholesale price must be within small c and small p, so it cannot be lower than the production cost, and it will not be greater than the unit retail price. the 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 return credit will be smaller than W, okay. So if I sell you product at ten dollars, I am not going to allow you to return at eleven dollars. If R is greater than W, then the retailer will not try to sell anything. Small f is continuous, and it must be the demand must be non-negative. Okay, these are just some technical assumptions for we to do the for us to do the derivations. So, 
As you know, the game starts from the manufacturer side. The manufacturer is going to offer a contract, and then the retailer makes the order decision. So, the retailer has observed the announced return contract W R and capital R, and then the retailer must formulate his own expected profit like this. Uh, in any case, I need to pay. This amount as my pur、uh, purchasing cost, and then according to my sales quantity, I'm going to earn some money. Okay, so what are them? My sales revenue can be found here. Okay, those terms that are multiplied with the retail price P. At the same time, my I may also earn some money. By returning my products, my unsold products, to the manufacturer, those are obtained with these small r terms. Okay, so we have、uh, here, here, and here as the sales revenue, and here and here as the return credits. So, in general, what we may have are、uh, three situations. So let me try to write it down. Okay, so let's say this is the possible demand. As a retailer, I may order at this level, okay, and then the demand may be either larger than my order quantity, or the demand may be lower than my order quantity. If the demand is greater than the order quantity, then I'm going to sell everything. And the sales quantity will be capital Q, so I will earn this amount, with probabilities for demand to be greater than capital Q. Okay, so this is the case in region three. How about the case that demand is less than quantity? In that case, we need to distinguish between two cases. So. One critical quantity is one minus r times q. Okay, this is because、uh, the manufacturer may not allow the retailer to return everything. Let's say if capital R is just、uh, one half. Okay, then if you order one thousand units, you are only allowed to return five hundred units. So. When I have this capital R, I know if I sell too much, if I sell a lot, then those remaining products can be returned. Otherwise, I cannot return everything. Okay, so let's read this formula.、Um, let's consider region one first. In region one, what happened? I only sell less than this quantity. Okay, I only sell less than this quantity. For each unit I sell, I earn small p as my profit, sales revenue. Okay, and then I cannot return everything. I can only return this amount. Okay, how much is it? Is r times q. Okay, is r times q. So I have a lot of leftover. But I am only allowed to return r times q because this is the maximum allowed return specified with this parameter capital R. For region two, that's another story. If I sell more than one minus r times q, but less than capital Q, then I'm going to again earn some sales revenue. But now. My return quantity will just be all my leftover, which is Q minus my demand. So this is my second region expected revenue, and of course this is the first region. So depending on different demand realization, I'm I can write down what will be my expected revenue, and collecting everything. Is going to give me the retailer's total profit, un total expected profit under an order quantity. For the manufacturer's expected profit is 
um, somewhat similar or just at the opposite side. The manufacturer needs to pay CQ as the production cost, and the manufacturer can earn Q times W as the wholesale revenue. But the manufacturer is also facing some risks about buying back the unsold products. This, of course, is what happened when the demand is very small. When the demand is very low or very small, the manufacturer is going to take capital R times capital Q back. Or if the demand is somewhat moderate, then the manufacturer only need to take back Q minus X, and X is the demand. Finally, if you sum the two terms up, you can see that the expected sales profit is just a very basic news vendor problem profit. Okay? You won't see small r, small w, and the capital R, because they are something that affect the interaction between the manufacturer and the retailer. So, R, R and W, they are internal, internal parameters uh, inside the system. From outside the system, no one really cares about or no one really sees these three parameters. So, from outside of the system, for example, from the, man, from the consumer's perspective, consumers only care about the order quantity or the inventory level. And that inventory level is going to determine the system profit. It's just one news vendor profit function. So the timing, let me try to re review the timing for you. First, they will sign a return contract. In this study, we do not specify how this return contract is determined. Okay? We do not assume it is the manufacturer's decision or the retailer's decision or who makes the decision. We just allow all the possibilities to occur. And we want to ask whether there is any return contract that can induce efficient order quantity. So we're going to assume the first, the, at the first stage a return contract is signed. And then the retailer must decide an order quantity. And then the manufacturer will make the production and deliver the products to the retailer. The retailer then sells to the uncertain demand after the demand is realized. And if there is any unsold product, the allowed unsold products will be returned to the manufacturer. That's the timeline of this problem. So now it's time to try to solve this problem. Again, we start with the benchmark which is just the system optimal inventory level. As you are already familiar with that, the system optimal inventory level is just this guy. Okay? If QT star is the optimal inventory level, it will satisfy this equation, this news vendor equation. This is based on the demand function. And the right hand side is just the critical ratio. And what we are looking at is whether there is a return contract that can make the retailer order QT star. We Of course, we already know if W is the only parameter, then the retailer will never order QT star. The retailer will order less than that. So we want to ask whether capital R and small r can induce the efficient result. So let's look at the retailer's problem. The retailer's expected profit is this one, right? So, in order to find the optimal decision, the retailer must differentiate his profit function with respect to capital Q. So, this takes some mathematical uh, training. We need to apply the Leibniz integral rule. Okay? Actually, you have used that when you are dealing with the very basic news vendor problem. But here, the problem is slightly more complicated, so let me try to uh, help you refresh your memory. <coughs> Suppose f of xy is a function such that the partial derivative 
with respect to y exists and is continuous. Okay, uh, these are some just some technical assumptions, and we're going to assume they are true. Then, how may we find the differentiation of the integral of f? Uh, we have this formula. So, uh, let me use this pi of q as an example. Let's look at this particular integral. Okay, what I am doing is that for this particular function, I have an integrand here. Okay, this is my integrand for this integral, and you can see that there is x. Okay, uh, x is here, x is here, and also there is capital Q. Okay. Capital Q is the variable that we are going to differentiate upon. So capital Q is the y variable here. And x, of course, is x here. Okay, well, you can see we are integrating the integral with respect to x. And then we will differentiate the result with respect to y or q. Here, one thing to keep in mind is this q also appears at the upper bound or lower bound of an integral just like the upper bound and the lower bound of this integral may be a function of y okay and then we have the formula here blah, 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 blah. basically all we need to do is first plug in the upper bound to the function get the result and then just like the chain rule multiply the outcome of differentiating the upper bound of with respect to y. And then minus the plug-in of lower bound, and then multiply the lower bound differentiated with respect to y. And then finally, the last term is to keep the original integral, but differentiate the integrand with respect to y. If we sum these three terms, together we get the result let's try to do this so the rule is here we know that the retailer's expected profit has four terms one two three four okay for the first term differentiate this term with respect to q is easy okay we just get this one for the second term okay huh, q is here q is here and we have, this is an upper bound, this is the lower bound. So the first term is to plug in the upper bound to small x. Okay, let me write it down. Small x is here, small x is here. Okay, I need to plug in the upper bound to the variable x, to the dummy variable x. So 1 minus r times q goes to here and here. Okay, no, 1 minus r goes to here, and 1 minus r times q goes to here and here. One thing to keep in mind is that um, after that, I also need to differentiate the upper bound with respect to y. So I need to differentiate this with respect to q. That's why I get 1 minus r. Okay, that's why I get 1 minus r. So that's the first term. For the second term, there is nothing because zero differentiate by uh, differentiated by dot by q. This term is just zero, so I don't have the second term. For the last term, I will keep the original lower bound and upper bound, and then differentiate the integrand by capital Q. So that's why I only leave this term there. R R and f of x. Okay. This is how I get the differentiation of the second term to this. I can repeat um, this process with this term and this term to get da 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 da. But you may want to do this verification by yourself. And then I will move on. So by collecting everything we just did in the previous slides and after some combinations, we can collectively get this particular formula as our result. Okay, 
if I differentiate q, uh, if I differentiate pi r by q, I get this. Okay. So now you know uh, learning calculus is useful. If you don't have that particular technique, you just cannot get this result. Okay. So with this, one. Uh, of course, we know that uh, the retailer should choose a quantity to satisfy this particular thing equals zero. Okay, that's my first order condition. The retailer should choose a quantity that make the first order derivative zero. Okay, so numerically or when function is attractable, attractable, we can find Q to satisfy this equals zero. That's the retailer's ordering strategy. What you should do before that is to make sure that uh, first, pi r of q should be concave, right? So you probably want to verify the second order derivative of this particular function. Okay, now differentiate this again with respect to capital Q to see whether the second order derivative is really negative. That can be done. And also, with that in mind, you can make sure that there is a unique root. So you will be able to find a Q to satisfy this equation. And that can also be done. So we're going to minimize the, 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 the amount of mathematics. So let's skip them. Just convince yourself that this can be done. And then, what we want to do is to compare the system optimal order quantity with the retailer optimal order quantity. We hope that if we plug in the system optimal order quantity to the retailer's first order condition, we hope that it can be satisfied. Okay? If Qt star is just satisfying the retailer's first order condition, then it's perfect. It means the retailer is going to feel that the system optimal order quantity is also optimal to himself. And then the retailer will order the system optimal quantity. So we know this is the function, right? And we ask whether plugging in Qt star can make it zero. One thing we know is that f of qt star, f of qt star must satisfy this. Okay? If it is system optimal, f of qt star must be p minus c over p. So p minus c over p can be placed into the first order condition. So now our question has re has been reduced to the following. We want to ask whether there is any WR and capital R so that this particular equation is satisfied. Okay? We want to ask whether such WRR exists or not. And if it exists, what are some properties that we may say about it? Okay? So that will be our um, task in the next video. Thank you. Okay, so now let's talk about how may we um, analyze the previous first order condition and what are the insights that we may get. So, <coughs> in the previous video, we have derived this particular equation. Okay, this is how the retailer's first order derivative is with the order quantity qt star. We want to see whether this particular quantity can be zero or not. So before we really try to solve it, we may first see some special cases. The first one is the most generous return contract. That means you are allowed to return everything unsold. And for each unit unsold, I pay you back what you have paid to me. Okay, R is W and the R is 1. In this case, the only situation that this particular um, quantity is 0 
is when c is zero. Or we can say, uh, as long as there is a positive production cost, then the order quantity is not going to be efficient if the contract is so generous. Uh, to prove it is very simple. If we plug in R to be W and the capital R to be 1, this particular equation can be reduced to blah 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 blah, this one. Okay? And because we know P is greater than W, all we, uh, the only possibility is for C to be 0, so that this equation can be 0. Okay? So, this proposition is true for every possible demand function okay and then it tells us that if we are allowing four returns with full contract and with four credits then in general it is system suboptimal okay if we are too generous if we are so generous like this what will you do as a retailer you will order as much as possible and the order quantity will be larger than QT star. Another situation is just the wholesale price contract. Now we also can prove it that with the wholesale price contract, it is impossible for the system to be efficient. Okay? So again, if R is 0, then we plug in R to be 0 somewhere there. And then we can see that this equation requires W to be C, which cannot be true. Okay? If capital R is 0, then again we can get something that is very similar. Again, it is impossible. So as long as R is 0 or capital R is 0, then the system cannot be optimal. When this happens, there is no risk sharing at all, and the order quantity must be smaller than QT star. So allowing no return is also system suboptimal. So now, let's consider four returns with partial credits. Suppose capital R is 1. Then we can show that for the system to be efficient, we need this equation, or we need W and R to be set according to this equation. So let's look at this first. Suppose R is 1, then the second term will be, uh, the last term will be cancelled. Okay? And then if we will need the first part to be 0, that's exactly what we need here. Okay? So that's one thing. Then we want to ask whether this is possible. For any P and C, R and W such that this constraint is satisfied can also be found to satisfy this system optimality equation. So basically that just means you may find R and W to satisfy this equation. Okay? So according to this equation, what we, if we do some arithmetics, what we really need is given each wholesale price, set the return credit according to this formula. And then because W is less than P, we can show that this particular ratio is less than W. You just need to do some um, arithmetics. And also because C is less than W, we can see that this is non-negative. Uh, or I should say it, it is positive. So that means as long as your W is less than P and greater than C, your R, according to this formula, will be greater than 0 and less than W, which is reasonable. Okay, So, uh, we just need to allow four returns, and then as long as we set up the partial credit according to this formula, then it will be system optimal. Okay, And then we say the return contract coordinates the system. So, this result is significant. We have shown that as long as we allow four returns with partial credits, then it is possible to find system optimal coordinating return contracts. And as, uh, to remind you, W is the wholesale price, R is the return credit, and here we can see W is just 
a linear function of r. Okay, so that means when r is small, w should be small. When r is large, then w is large. Okay, reasonable. And also we can see if r is zero, w is just c. So that means if your wholesale price is just your production cost, then to achieve system efficiency, your return credit should be zero. On the other hand, if your R is W, or if you are so generous about return credits, if your R is W, then we can show that um, you can still find a a, a, con a, a contract to coordinate this system. Okay, so these are something you may expect. Interestingly, you can see that from the system's perspective, all the pairs of W and R that satisfy this equation are the same because the system together earns the maximum amount of money. But we also care about whether both players benefit from the maximized total profit. Okay? Because previously, under a wholesale price contract, each of them are earning some amount of money. If under return contracts, um, the system profit is maximum, is, the system profit is a lot, but some, uh, one of them are earning fewer amount of money, then that return contract cannot be implemented. So we need to ensure win-win. Okay? And then we are hoping that the system profit can be split to the two players in any way we like or arbitrarily. Okay? So that's what we want. We know we are able to make the pie the maximized. Okay? We know we can get the efficient pie. And then we ask whether this pie can be split arbitrarily or not. So, to answer this question, let's first look at two limiting cases. Suppose W is C, oh, that means I as a wholesaler, I set the wholesale price to be my cost. As we mentioned, then R should be zero. In this case, as a manufacturer, I earn nothing. Okay, When I sell, I earn nothing, When, though I don't need to pay any return credits. And if I get nothing, that means the retailer gets everything. And then, in another limiting case, if my wholesale price is so large, if my wholesale price is P, okay, then I need to guarantee the retailer for all the unsold unit. In this case, I as a manufacturer, I earn everything, and the retailer is just my slave for um, getting my product and sell them. Okay, when I sell the product. The, manuf the retailer gets nothing, and I just guarantee the retailer that it will not lose any money. Okay, so in this special case, the manufacturer earns everything. How about the intermediate case? Let's discuss it. So, the set of coordinating four return contracts can be um, depicted like this. So, let me do this. I know I have W and I have R, okay? These two parameters are something that I should decide when I am designing a return contract. W should be between C and P, okay? And R should be between 0 and P. In the previous slide, we have the equation and you may verify that when W is C, your return credit should be zero. When W is P, your return credit should also be P. And because that function is linear, so it will just be this one. Okay. If you choose W and R so that you are uh, the WR pair locates on this particular line segment then the system profit will be maximized. Also, we, ob we have observed the following. If W is C, then that means 
the retailer is earning everything. Okay, at this particular point, or if the wholesale price is P, then the manufacturer is earning everything. Okay, so that means we may draw another graph like this. So let's say uh, this is W. Okay, W is from C to P. So there is one level which is just pi T star. What I want to draw is are the a manufacturer's and the retailer's profit as a function of the coordinating wholesale price. When W is C, the manufacturer is getting nothing. Okay? But when W is P, the manufacturer is getting everything. And what's more important is that because this particular function is continuous, so our function must go gradually go up from 0 to pi t star. Okay, So that means it must be something like this. So, for example, this one. Okay, It may be of another shape. It may even go up and down, but at the beginning it is at 0, and at the end it must go up to pi t star. So this blue line is pi m star. Okay, And then I'm going to draw another curve to depict the retailer's profit. It must be pi t star subtract pi m star. Okay. So it will look like uh, this. Oh, it's not very pretty, but you know what I mean. Pi m star and pi t star, I'm uh, sorry, pi m star and pi r star, some of them must be pi t star. Okay, so the sum of the two curves must be exactly pi t star. And the black one is just the retailer's profit. So if this is the case, then we know arbitrary profit splitting can be achieved. Okay, given any level of a uh, profit you want, you know where it, there is a W that can help you to get that uh, allocation. Okay, no matter what's the amount of money you want to give to the manufacturer, there is a wholesale price that can do that. For example, if you want uh, the manufacturer to get this amount, then you just need to find out oh, there is a wholesale price that can achieve this. And then you are allowed to really split the pie according to this um, setting. So now we have confirmed that return contrasts are really um, amazing. Okay. It can help the system to earn the maximum possible amount of money. And it can definitely make everybody happy. Because everyone can earn more than previously earned. So we are about to give you a conclusion. We now know that return contracts can be coordinating. It can induce the retailer to order the efficient inventory level and then make the channel efficient. Also, it can be win-win, and this is very important because this is how the supply chain players are willing to participate in a return contract. So as a manufacturer, if I am smart enough, I can offer, I can design a return contract that can induce the retailer to accept, okay? because I am able to make the retailer happy to accept the return contract because the retailer is able to earn more while I am also earning more. So this is very, a very important property for the contract to be really implementable. The two players will agree to adapt a coordinating return contract because of this win-win property. And also the consumer can also benefit from channel coordination. Why? Basically, the consumers only care about one thing, which is the inventory level. Okay, because the retail price 
has been fixed. So the consumer just want the channel can offer as much quantity as possible. The consumers prefer a higher quantity. So under the coordinating contract, the quantity, the inventory level is QT star. And we know it is greater than Q star under the wholesale price contract. Okay, so that just means if the two players choose to coordinate with the return contract, then consumers also benefit from it. Finally, I want to um, tell you, coordinating is good, but not all the coordinating contracts are win-win. Sometimes a coordinating contract cannot make everyone happy. One of the players is going to get everything. In that case, the coordinating contract may not be implementable. And also, uh, you probably want to think about this. In practice, some manufacturers are saying to the retailers that, um, I'm going to sell you some product. If you cannot sell all of them, I'm going to compensate you. But you don't need to ship the physical goods back to me. Okay? The manufacturer does not want those unsold finished goods. But the manufacturer will still pay the retailer even though those items are not shipped back to the manufacturer. I think you are able to find the reason behind this. Okay? It's just about incentives. The manufacturer wants to buy back those products not because the manufacturers want those savage value. It's because the manufacturer wants to provide incentives for the retailers to earn more. Okay? Everything is about incentives. So, in this paper, we only, uh, this paper discussed about the retain contract. We only introduced the main idea of this paper. There are still a lot of things that we did not touch in this paper. For example, this paper showed you that savage values and shortage costs can also be incorporated in the model. Nothing will really change. The paper has shown that the manufacturers and the retailers' expected profit are monotone or monotonely increasing and decreasing when W goes up. Okay? Previously, we drew this figure, right? Well, this is C, this is P, this is wholesale price, manufacturer's profit, and the retailer's profit, like this. Intuitively, this is true, and the paper can show you that this is really true. The manufacturer's profit goes up, maybe non-linear, but it always goes up with W, and the retailer's profit goes down. Finally, the paper even showed that if there are multiple retailers, the manufacturer can steal or when it is impossible for the manufacturer to coordinate everything here. Okay? So it's very interesting to see what's going to happen if there are multiple retailers. And if you want, read the paper by yourself. Okay? In general, this opens the field of supply chain coordination or channel coordination about how different formats of contract may or may not coordinate a supply chain. It was really a hot topic about 30 years ago, and every topic will be dead eventually, so now it is not so hot. But I just want to give you this idea about coordination, because this is one of the very good examples about mechanism design. Okay, Through the change of contract format, we are changing the gaming rule and we are changing the equilibrium behaviors of players and then we may achieve a better result. There are other contracts that may coordinate a channel or a supply chain or to name a few two-part tariffs, quantity flexible, revenue sharing, sales rebate, blah 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 and blah. Well, they are just a lot. In the lectures we will discuss some of them to give you more ideas about how to give incentives, how to align incentives in a supply chain with different kinds of contracts. Thank you.